Okay, we are recording. I'm going to share, um, I'm actually gonna spend most of today in PowerPoint uh, rather than in um, uh, doing demos. Um, so, okay, thanks to everyone for joining. Uh, today I'm gonna to talk about uh, the stuff that I do behind the scenes um, on my flight book, stuff that, that you don't get to see, uh, but you might be interested in. It. Um, it's gonna get geeky uh, and, and uh, data oriented. Uh, but uh, we're a small, small, so by all means, uh, uh, unmute yourself if you have a question. Don't we can make this as interactive as you want. Uh, if I'm if I'm getting too deep in the weeds and something that's uninteresting, just say so, and I'll pull out. Um, or if you if you want to go deeper, that's fine uh, too. So uh, with that, um, so the system has admin accounts and uh, it, it's actually a role based system so instead of saying so and so person is an admin uh, what it what it does is everybody has one of uh, a number of roles hold on so I just had I think it said 11 participants oh, I have other people here to admit admit all ah now I can now I can let everybody in okay so apologies if you're just uh, uh, joining I, I couldn't figure out how to turn off the um, the waiting room. I thought I had had turned that off in the first place. Anyhow, uh, the every account in the system is flagged with uh, one of several different roles, and you can have multiple roles. So everybody has the basic role of pilot, and then on top of that, you can be a support person, a data manager, a reporter, an accountant, or a site admin, or any combination of those things, and. Uh, all the functionality I'm going to show uh, from here on requires one or more of those uh, uh, of those roles. So the idea behind a support role is that you can help people who need help. So you can reset passwords, you can impersonate them to uh, troubleshoot stuff in their account, uh, and you receive the um, uh, contact us email uh, when when somebody you like anything from Chick Fil A uses that. Um, data managers have access to the tools that will uh, manage the, the uh, models, aircraft, airports, um, and things like that on the system. Um, a reporter can view reports on the system, so that's mostly um, site stats. There's one page on that and it gets emailed every night uh, as well. Uh, there's an accountant who can view and manage uh, the donations. Thank you for everyone who donates. Um, and then site admin. Uh, gets to do everything above uh, plus uh, all the site stuff. So um, you get uh, emails about uh, errors on the site, crash reports, um, things like that. So, uh, dive in and I'll just talk about some key scenarios here. So my day um, is, uh, is not that busy on on support. Um, so it, it, you know, the, the, a lot of the questions are answered in the in the FAQ. But the most common uh, things I do get are uh, people who forgot their password and are having difficulty with the uh, the password reset system or have a locked account. If you sign, if you do ten or twenty, I forget failed sign-ins within a short period of time, then the system will freeze your account and there's nothing you can do, even with the correct password, until, until I come along and unlock you. Um, and uh, I do get feature requests or questions. Uh, if someone if should you're going, to, if you're going to have any, I'll do a large. If it's not going to... Uh, well, let me... It is B who needs to be uh, muted. With, uh, I am going to mute B. Okay, B is muted, thank you. Um, I, get, I do get feature requests and questions every day, but it's you know, one or two, um, you know, there are busy days and there are quiet days. Uh, but I'd say on average, it's somewhere between two and five uh, uh, requests for support or feature, or I'm confused about why my currency isn't updating or things like that that I, that I go through. 
Um, and then the, the data management, it's a little, it's on the same order of magnitude. It's more than anything, it's, it's people editing aircraft um, and uh, people creating or editing uh, models of aircraft and just making sure that it's following the right conventions. And I'll talk about that in a, uh, a little bit more depth. But it's also um, developer oriented stuff, making sure that the site is being responsive uh, and seeing where there are crashes. So whenever you do something on the site and you get that oops and error has occurred, uh, page, um, which hopefully you're not seeing, I get an email that includes both your identity, the page you were on, and a whole bunch of diagnostic information so I can go in and figure out what happened and hopefully uh, fix it. So um, uh, with that, you know, most of what I do, I do through email. There's a lot of detail on this page I'm not going to go into, but I, I get email for every new user, and I can tell whether or not that it, whether it was done on the website or using a mobile app. Um, and the main thing I use that for is just, it, it tells me if the site is up, if I'm not getting new users, something's not right. Uh, or sometimes I'll have, you know, I'll, I'll get so many new users in one day and I'll get like five times as many the next day. That tells me that maybe somebody posted something on the web or there was a news article where I was mentioned. Uh, and so I can use it for that too. Um, somebody creates a new manufacturer or, um, or a model. Um, the key things on, on that are sometimes people do new manufacturers where they make up a name like Various. Um, I have one uh, built-in manufacturer that is, a, that is a pseudo manufacturer called Generic. Um, I like people to use that and that's because the system knows that Generic can't be an actual registered flying machine. Um, and then some of the manufacturers are um, have other restrictions. For example, if you do Frasca, they make SIMs. So um, that manufacturer gets flagged as SIM only. Um, uh, and generic can be either SIM or anonymous, you know, an anonymous uh, single engine air, uh, land aircraft or something like that. Um, new models, uh, the main things are consistency. Uh, you know, uh, Cessnas used C-172. Pipers use PA-28 without the hyphen. Um, you want to make sure that it's got the right ICAO identifier, that it's not dupl a duplicate of, a, of an existing model. Um, it's things like that. Uh, interestingly, one of, the, one of the big ones is, is people assigning type IDs to non-type rated aircraft or uh, putting in no, like you know, with, for the type rating. No, no, there's no type rating required for a C-172. Um, so uh, sometimes if, if people modify an aircraft, I have a whole set of rules for whether the system modifies the underlying aircraft when it's shared between users uh, or if it clones it, but I get a notification regardless so that I can wade in if, if it's appropriate. And so if somebody changes a vanilla C-172 to a 172S, um, super, I have nothing to do, that, that's great. Um, if there's a back and forth on an aircraft or if they're, uh, is something that looks like it's a more significant change or something like that, then I'll often uh, wade in on, on that. Um, so I, I get, uh, as I mentioned before, every uh, night at midnight, I get uh, uh, stats, uh, I get email about locked accounts, and I get emails about uh, crashes. Whoops, why did I go back here? Ah, oh, there we go, okay. So um, I also get emails from uh, the Contact Us page. Uh, on the website, it just says, uh, 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 it has a stock uh, subject line, but when it comes from one of the mobile apps, it includes the word iPad uh, or Android or uh, iPhone. So I know, I, you know when, they, when they're talking about some functionality, I know which platform they're on. Um, it's things like reset passwords or requests for features or things like that. And uh, as I said, I, I get a few of these a day, um, most days. It's, it's not all that much. So it, here is what I see that none of you uh, get to see. Uh, next to the profile tab, I have an admin uh, tab. And you see some subset of this based on the role that your account has. And if your account has none of the roles, then you don't see the tab at all. But like, you know, if, you're, if you have the accountant role, then the admin tab has, has exactly one um, item in it, which is donations. So I'm going to walk through uh, these sort of one at a time. 
So for customer support, the most important one is that, uh, that first one there, use, user management. I probably use that more than any other one. Um, and when I go in there, it'll show me any locked accounts and I just click a button to unlock it. Um, uh, but otherwise, I can, I can search for a user uh, by, their, uh, by their name, first name, last name, by their email address, or by their username. So you, you sign in using your username, uh, sorry, using your email address, but then the email address uh, actually maps to an underlying username. Uh, and the username is, is unique and never changes. You can change your email address, uh, but, but your username doesn't. And I generate, I generate your username for you automatically based on your email address. Um, and in fact, you can see here, I've got my, my username is Eric B.E. because my original email that I was using um, on the system was Eric B.E. at. Um, and then, uh, and so I just, I generally use what's left of the at sign as your username and then, you know, do one, two, three as needed to make it unique. But you can see here, I've actually changed my email address on the system to uh, gmail.com, username is the same. Uh, so once you find that, then uh, you, once you find the user that you want to help, uh, there's a bunch of things that you can do for them. Uh, the first one, which is uh, here, uh, the first button is impersonate. I probably use that more than anything else. And when I do that, um, I get a little header, which you can see here that says uh, user Eric B.E., that's me, is impersonating user and then that person's username. Uh, and then there's a stop button. The rest of the site then behaves as if I were the impersonated user. Um, you can see, for example, here, there's no admin tab. Why? Because that user doesn't have any admin privileges. Um, and I can also do this, believe it or not, on the um, mobile apps. If I sign in, or if, if one signs in using the uh, username of the person you want to impersonate, colon, and then your email and password, then as long as you, know, you have to sign in with your email and password to prove that you are who you say you are, and then your account further has to have uh, customer support privileges. And if all of that is true, and then you can emulate uh, user ABC. And so that's how I can troubleshoot problems that people are having on the mobile uh, devices. Um, but there are other things that I, that I do uh, for users here. If I click uh, reset password, it'll generate a password. I can, e I can send that in email to people and there's even a button that will do that automatically. Um, I hate doing that because email is insanely insecure um, and it's, I'm sending a clear text password in, in, the, uh, in the clear when I do that, which I don't want to do. But sometimes people have trouble uh, with the password reset process. And the password reset process never exposes a password in the clear. So that, that's good. Um, I also have buttons to delete um, uh, the flights for a user or the, the entire user. These are, the, 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 that's functionality that you have for yourself on the website. If you go under profile account, there's a section called big red buttons. Uh, and, and both of those are, are there that you can press as well. Uh, I don't, often delete an entire user, but sometimes people email me and say, I want to close my account. Um, and uh, actually people have been pretty good about finding the big red button. So I haven't been using these uh, very much over the past uh, couple of years since I put in the big red buttons. Um, there's a send message uh, a function. It just lets me type in a quick message and email it. I almost never use that. I generally just use my Gmail account. And there's an endow club creation button to give somebody uh, uh, privileges to create a club if they haven't uh, donated. Um, I, I don't use that very often either. Um, but there are other places where you can, um, uh, while not actually impersonate an account, at least access their data. Uh, the most common way I do this is in certain pages. Um, you, if you add A equals one to the URL, um, then it puts you in an admin mode. And so as long as the account you're signed in has the right privileges, generally the customer support privileges, um, it'll let you, uh, it'll bypass the normal security and let you view somebody's flight or um, uh, whatever, view their, view their aircraft or things like that. So in this case, um, if I 
uh, if I add it to a, a particular flight, if I didn't have the A equals one or if I didn't have the privileges, I would get an error saying, you don't own that flight, go away. Uh, but in this case, um, I can, uh, I can uh, view the flight, which helps me for troubleshooting. Uh, but one of the other things I use it for is um, if you sign a flight uh, and the signature gets out of whack, I can look at the cause of uh, the signature being out of whack. Uh, so if you can see down here at the bottom, uh, changes to the flight. This, this flight was signed and you can see that uh, I added a period uh, to the, to the uh, comments uh, and that invalidated the signature because I modified the flight. And so the saved, um, the, the, the flight is invalid. Uh, it, it looks like it should be invalid. And then there's a hash of the flight and a, uh, uh, that was signed and a hash of the uh, flight in its current form. And I can look at those, whoops, and, uh, and see if, if the, if, if the uh, signature state is incorrect. So there are actually a few legitimate cases where the flight can change and um, and, and the signature gets invalidated, but actually the signature should stay valid. So for example, sometimes if I merge two duplicate aircraft, the aircraft changes for the flight and that invalidates the flight. But if it was actually, essentially, they were duplicate aircraft, I can see that in the hash here and I can say force valid to make it valid, or I can say fixed signature, um, you know, if it should be invalid and it's not, I can, I can make it match reality. But this lets me, um, this lets me troubleshoot um, uh, issues with signatures or again, view a flight just for troubleshooting. So let me dive into some more data management stuff. Um, one of the items on the, on the menu is manufacturers. This one's a pretty simple uh, uh, tool. It highlights any duplicate uh, manufacturers. Sometimes uh, people will, will put in the same one. And so what I can do is I can pick one to keep and one to kill, and then it will map all of the models in the one that I kill over to the one that I keep. And you know, it should be transparent to the user um, because, because if they're duplicate names, then it, it, it shouldn't make any difference, but it helps keep uh, the, the, the data a little bit uh, clean. Um, otherwise, I can just review um, and all, all of the uh, manufacturers, and I can also uh, set restrictions. So I can do things like I can, I can edit it. People will sometimes put in uh, the, the manufacturer with all capital letters, and it generally looks better if it's, uh, if it's sentence capitalization, you know, Cessna with a capital C, things like that. Um, but I can also indicate that this model um, is only for sims. They, th there is no such thing as a flying machine that is this, uh, 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 that, that is this manufacturer. Uh, Microsoft would be one of these, you know, for Microsoft Flight Sim. Um, sim or generic but not real means that you can create models that are simulators, or you, uh, you can create models that allow for anonymous aircraft, uh, but you're not allowed to create registered flying machines. And so generic is a good example of that. You know, a generic single engine land, a generic uh, multi-engine complex, things like that. And it shows me how many models each uh, manufacturer has, so that if someone creates a, a, a manufacturer and a week passes and they don't create any models um, on it, I'll often clean that up and delete it just to get rid of clutter. I've already got, I don't know, 3,000 models in the system, something uh, crazy like that. So then the next one is in fact a model. So the, the hierarchy here is that every flight is tied to an aircraft, every aircraft is tied to a model, and every model is tied to a manufacturer. So there's only one Cessna in the system, and there's one Boeing. And we, you know, the, the Boeing ma manufacturer has a Boeing 737 and a Boeing 777 and a Boeing 747. And there's only you know, one 737-800 in the system, for example. And there can be many aircraft that are tied to that one 737-800. Uh, um, so on the models page, um, there are basically three sets of things that I do. Uh, one is I've, I see if there are any models that should be sims. Um, I've got a little green, uh, no suspect makes models here. Uh, found that at, when I took this screenshot, there were none. But the idea here is um, somebody creates a, uh, a manufacturer uh, that, that, is, that strictly makes sims, and then they make a model out, off of that manufacturer 
and then they uh, go and uh, uh, make some some aircraft off of that, some sims or something. And then I I review the uh, you know, and I, I'm out grocery shopping or something. I come home, I see the email about the manufacturer and I say, oh, that should be a SIM. I flag it as SIM only. Well, now the model that was created off of that manufacturer is not marked as um, SIM only. And so that's a problem here. And so I, that alerts me to it and I can, I can fix it. I can also see orphaned uh, models. So these are things where uh, somebody created a model but never ever created an aircraft off of it. And so again, I'll, if, if, if an, a model is orphaned for a while, I'll go and clean it up just to reduce the number of, uh, uh, of aircraft in the system. I've already got over 8,000 aircraft, uh, air, sorry, models in the system. I've already got over 8,000. And so anything I can do to uh, reduce that. Um, and then the, I can also review uh, type designations to make sure that they're consistent. So for example, uh, Boeing 777s, uh, we just, just out of convention following the FAA type ratings uh, PDF, I use B hyphen triple seven, not B triple seven. And so it just is, I can, I can review stuff like that and just spot little inconsistencies. Um, and then the other thing I do is I uh, look for, uh, that was the orphan models. I look for duplicates. Um, and I can, just as I do with, with manufacturers, if I see two, uh, models that look like they're the same thing, I can keep one and uh, delete the other and it will update the, all of the aircraft uh, that are the model that I'm deleting to be the one that I'm keeping. And again, that should be transparent to everybody. It doesn't actually uh, uh, change, you know, if an aircraft is a Boeing 737 before it kind of by definition is still a Boeing 737 under the covers, the database entry that that 737 is pointing to is, is changed, but that's about it. Oh, and when you're, when you're creating a new aircraft, instead of seeing two Boeing 737-800s, you only see one because they were duplicates. Um, yeah, and this is what it looks like. So, you know, you can keep one and you can kill the other. You hit preview and it shows you all the aircraft that are going to be uh, updated. Um, and so these are uh, uh, all the aircraft that are ASC-21, that is ID 1979, and those are going to be updated to be ID 562, which is also an ASC-21. So again, it, it, it's not uh, anything that, uh, that, that, that should be visible to any, uh, any pilot. The aircraft tab is probably the busiest one. It's actually lately the one I've been using uh, the most. Uh, it's got a bunch of, of stuff that I can do. So the first um, thing is dupe aircraft. I can, I can find aircraft that are potentially duplicates of one another. Um, shouldn't happen. Uh, in fact, I can't remember the last time it happened. I think I caught all of the, the final things that would allow that to happen, but it does occasionally happen. Uh, when I merge models, uh, you know, removing duplicate ones, I can get duplicate sims. And so this helps me uh, to merge those. Um, sims and anonymous aircraft in the system, there's only one, ever one of a given model. Um, so there is, you know, if you have a Boeing 737-800, there is exactly one aircraft in the system that is an ATD of that 737-800. There's one that's an FTD of that 737-800. So there's uh, ATD, FTD, full flight sim, and uncertified. So there's four different sims uh, and one, gen one anonymous uh, for each model. Um, Invalid aircraft, just in case something somewhere slipped under the covers and uh, became uh, violated uh, uh, one of my uh, integrity checks, or if I add an, an integrity check after the fact, uh, this will help find them. Again, uh, I, don't, I don't click that very often. Uh, I can view all SIMs in the system. Uh, orphaned aircraft I do uh, use fairly frequently. And with orphaned aircraft, um, what it does, here, this one I can actually, I can actually demo. Uh, let me see, where did I go? Uh, what do I have to do here? Screen share. Um, well, maybe I won't demo. I'm having trouble figuring out how to switch over to it, but, um, It'll show me all of the orphaned aircraft in the system. And an orphaned aircraft just means no pilot has it in their set of, uh, of, of aircraft that they fly. And so it's clutter. 
Um, and in fact, often if I delete the orphaned aircraft, that me makes a model an orphan and I can delete the model. And then sometimes if I delete the model, then the manufacturer is an orphan and I can delete that. And it just helps me keep things clean. I can also look for pseudo generic aircraft. And this is people entering aircraft with tail numbers like C-172, um, or, which you see fairly frequently. Um, and those are, are more properly mapped to be a generic uh, a, a, um, an anonymous aircraft. And uh, so I, I'll show how I do that in, in a moment. Uh, if there are uh, duplicate uh, user aircraft, uh, this will I can clean those up. And this is where you have the same aircraft in your account twice. Again, shouldn't happen. Um, uh, but uh, you know, a while ago I had a few bugs. I think I've cleaned them all up because I haven't seen any in a long time. Country codes. I can uh, manage country codes. So for example, in the US, November typically does not have a hyphen after it, uh, but China, uh, the, the B, does have a hyphen after it. And so there's a, there's a bunch of different um, uh, uh, conventions around that. And so I can clean uh, that up. For the most part, I enforce this on new aircraft rather than uh, bulk updating existing aircraft. Uh, but if you make an edit to an aircraft, that will typically um, update the hyphenation on the tail number. And, um, uh, I've gone through all of, the, all of the 180 different or 200 different prefixes. Um, it also lets me uh, edit, there's a URL template that I can use uh, for looking up aircraft. So when you're on the, the details page for an aircraft, there's a registration link that shows or hides based on, um, on the country code prefix. So in the US, I have a link to the FAA website. That works great. Canada, Australia, I have them. South Africa, I have them. A lot of countries, I couldn't find a link where you can, where you can just go and, and look up the registration of an aircraft. So if your aircraft begins with one of those country codes, it doesn't. But this is where I can manage all of that. Um, SIMs and generic aircraft or uh, uh, anonymous aircraft should not have any maintenance on them, kind of by definition, they're not real aircraft. Um, uh, this is another sort of legacy tool. Uh, it, can, it can remove any, any maintenance on such aircraft. And I have a tool that if I realize that there's a whole bunch of aircraft that should have been, that are listed as A36s, but they should have been BE36s or stuff like that, I can import a, um, a CSV file and do a bulk uh, mapping. But probably the most, you, uh, most common thing I'll uh, use is find aircraft by tail, where I can just type in a tail number and look it up. And then I go to, uh, there we go, this screen here. Ah. OK, sorry, uh, PowerPoint's being a little slow here. So this is the, um, this is the, the aircraft details page that, that uh, everybody has seen if you've ever used my flight book on the website. Um, but again, it's got the little A equals one in the URL, uh, which lets me do this as an admin. And it says here, I'm in admin mode here. And so the behavior of this page changes a little bit. Uh, one of the most important things is that when I click update aircraft, um, if I weren't in admin mode, it would add the aircraft to my account. If, and obviously, I'm, I'm a user too. I don't want all these aircraft that, I'm, that I uh, touch in my admin role in my account. So when, when I'm in admin, role, uh, admin mo mode, it won't add the aircraft to my account. Um, so a few of the changes here is I have a little locked uh, checkbox here. So sometimes, rarely, but sometimes uh, there's some back and forth on an aircraft. Um, and so I can lock it and then nobody can edit the aircraft but me or anybody else with, with data uh, privileges. Um, everything else on the page is pretty much the same, except down here. So you may have all noticed be, um, uh, before up here that at the top in the stats, it says this aircraft is used by two users and 42 flights or whatever the numbers are for, for uh, the particular aircraft. Well, I don't, I'm not telling you who those users are, but if I'm on this page in admin mode, I see who all of the users are and how many flights they have in the aircraft. Uh, and that, that's useful to me if I need to reach out to somebody to ask them a question about, hey, yo, was this really factory direct for, with the G1000 or was it a, re, a retrofit? Or can you confirm that this has a constant speed propeller and not the fixed pitch variant or whatever the, the question I have is. Um, 
I have a button. I do need a thing in the URL, but I have a button that will migrate to a generic. So if they're, um, if, if they made up a tail number of C172 for a Cessna 172, then if I click on migrate to generic, it'll change the aircraft in their account to be an anonymous C-172 and it'll, it'll remove this aircraft. And again, that reduces clutter and more importantly, it reduces uh, potential conflicts with actual registered flying machines. Uh, Canada owns the C prefix and they could uh, register an aircraft C-172. Uh, the other thing that I can do is I can create a new version of the aircraft. So an aircraft's on floats part of the year. Um, and wheels part of the year or for whatever, you know, it, it, uh, it's been upgraded in some way that, it, that uh, you can't, uh, that it doesn't automatically clone. I can force a clone uh, by saying, uh, by choosing a model, you know, clicking a little pencil here and picking a new model, clicking create new version. And anybody, who, uh, any pilot who flies the plane for whom I check this box here that says migrate to new aircraft, they'll go into the new cloned aircraft and everyone else will be left in the existing uh, aircraft. Um, so for the most part, um, uh, air, aircraft editing uh, is automatic. All tools I have are, you can't edit a, an aircraft that is a SIM or a generic or locked. And that's because, well, a SIM or generic or anonymous uh, you know, there's only one anonymous Boeing 737-800 in the system, so you can't edit it. It's, it's intrinsically tied to that model. Uh, uh, ditto the four flavors of SIM that can be tied to that. And uh, if, if I lock it, then you can't edit it. Um, if, you're, if you're flying an aircraft and you're the only one in that aircraft and you edit the aircraft, great. Uh, the aircraft itself is edited uh, and I do not get email. That's, that's just, just your issue. Um, Otherwise, if you do a major change to the aircraft, so other people are flying the aircraft as well as you, and you make a major change, which I define as either the um, ICAO code changes or the category class changes. So if you go from a 737 to a 172, that's the ICAO code changing. Or if you go from a, a, a 172 on wheels to a 172 on floats, that's also a major change then I automatically clone the aircraft and put you into the clone. I get an email and all the pilots in that aircraft get an email. I also get uh, one additional button on that page you just saw, uh, a make default button that lets me pick which is the default version of the aircraft. And usually what I'll do is I'll look it up on the FAA website or however I can look it up. And you know, if this is something where you know, the 172 crashed five years ago and the tail number got reassigned to a 737 and somebody just made it a Boeing 737, I'll make the 737 the default because that's more likely to be used for uh, subsequent flights and subsequent users because it's actually still flying. Um, and all default means is that when you're importing or something like that and it, um, and you, you, are referencing an aircraft by tail number, it'll default to that one. You can always switch to the other one, but it just tells me which one is, is preferred. Uh, any other edit to the aircraft is considered a minor change. And you know, so this is a, a C-172N to a C-172S. Uh, I, the, the system automatically changes uh, the underlying aircraft. So all the pilots are, are impacted and all the pilots and me get an email announcing the change. And that way, somebody who doesn't like the change can squawk about it and I can get involved and uh, we, can, we can figure it all out. And that actually works reasonably well. Um, next thing uh, in the admin tools is images and videos. Uh, the, the architecture for images and videos on the site is a little complicated. So the flow is that you upload your image or video or PDF up to my flightbook. My flightbook generates a thumbnail and saves it in the file system on the server, and it sends the full-sized video or image uh, up to Amazon uh, Web Services. And so uh, whenever you're, you're just scrolling through your flights on your iPhone or, or in, on, the, on, the, uh, on the website, it's just serving thumbnails. And I'm doing that from the file system on the, on the uh, server because it's very, very fast. And that way I'm also, it's cheap too. I don't have to pay Amazon for it. But when you click on the image uh, or click on the video, that gets served from 
uh, from Amazon because that's where the full size image uh, lives. Um, and so you know, a bunch of reasons that I do that, but one of the things that that means is that now there's, the data is sort of split across two platforms and there's a little bit of management required around that. So I offer that as background uh, for the uh, admin tools images. And I have a old screenshot here from the old, uh, <laughs> the old UI theme. Uh, but there are uh, just some tools for managing uh, orphans. And an orphan is something that is on, uh, on S3, but, uh, on Amazon, but not in my system, or that's in my system, but not on, um, uh, uh, not on Amazon. Uh, I, can, I can see any images that, are, uh, that have, have problems. So for example, this image here, for, for some reason, did not get migrated uh, up to Amazon uh, Web Services. Um, and uh, so I can try again. So that might have been just some uh, transient network uh, failure or things like that. Um, and then for each of the, the uh, images, and I actually now have, there are three image types here, but I'm actually up to five now. Flights can have images, aircraft can have images, you can have endorsements, uh, there's basic med images, and there's um, uh, offline endorsements that, that instructors can use. And for all of them, I can make sure that uh, the images on disk are in sync with in the database and I can, uh, I can delete any orphans that are up on, uh, up on Amazon. I can also click to review uh, these, am uh, these images. Uh, so my goal here is mostly around uh, ensuring compliance uh, and, and appropriate usage. So uh, please don't upload copyrighted material unless you own the copyright. Uh, please don't upload porn, things like that. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll go in and delete duplicates. Um, and this is where I can also migrate any of those images that are, that did not successfully move up to Amazon uh, web services and, and make, make sure that they, they get up there. And so this is what that screen looks like. Um, so I can press a button to move in this case up to a uh, uh, hundred, uh, I, I can do it by, uh, limited by so, uh, megabytes or by number of images. Uh, and I click that and it'll, it'll migrate up to that many bytes or that many images. It shows me, um, I can page through uh, the set. Uh, it'll let me uh, uh, go see the, the image in context if I want. I can delete images if they're inappropriate or if they're duplicates. Um, I can also, in the case of flights, I can get a link to the images, uh, to the flight's aircraft, because sometimes it, they, people upload um, an image to the flight that actually should be in the, in the aircraft because it's a picture of the aircraft. I, I don't do that very often. In fact, it's been a long time since I've done that. The, the, volume, the volume of images is more than I can <laughs> spend any meaningful amount of time reviewing. Uh, let's see, so I just talked about that. Okay. I have a, an admin tool for user airports. So I can take a look at all of the user created airports and look for duplicates or uh, uh, fix naming conventions or things like that. More frequently, what I'll end up doing is I, I have some bulk upload tools. Um, so periodically I will, uh, in fact, I just did this yesterday. I will download uh, the data from the FAA website and then I can upload it and uh, see what conflicts there are or uh, changes there are. And I can, airport by airport, I can review it. Um, so, you know, I don't have to do it if there are 30,000 airports in, in the dump. I don't do it for 30,000 airports. So it's anything that has um, changed location or changed type versus what's in the database. Uh, it gives me a chance to review. And that's because airport co airports close, airports get new identifiers. Um, or sometimes something's coded at a slightly different uh, latitude, longitude, things like that. Um, and I have a tool that will look for duplicate airports where somebody created um, an airport that's you know, a few meters away from another uh, uh, airport for the same uh, basic location. And I can resolve those duplicates. I see I have a, a chat. Oh, so somebody asked, uh, B asked, uh, how do you handle registration changes? Plane had one end number, now another. Pilot flew the same plane with both numbers. That one's easy. The system treats them as completely different uh, aircraft. The fact that it's the same piece of metal is not really relevant. You flew November one, two, three, four, five. Now you're flying November four, five, six, seven. 
So that's, uh, that's an answer to, to that question. Sorry, I didn't see that question when we were on the uh, aircraft page. Uh, properties. Uh, this is something that uh, people are often asking me, hey, I'd like to have a, uh, a new property to keep track of uh, some kind of mission that I'm doing. You know, I'm doing uh, pipeline inspections or I'm doing uh, uh, you know, landings in whiteout conditions or things like that. And uh, one of the nice things about my architecture is that I don't have to do a database um, I, I don't have to modify um, the, the database architecture to add new things. Um, I have the notion, I, I do have a bunch of core fields, um, you know, your total flight time and your, your how much night time and how many landings, every flight has those fields. But then I have, uh, it's currently up to close to uh, 700, um, what, what I call properties, it's a, it's a geeky uh, computer science term for it. Uh, but uh, these are things that you can attach to a flight and they behave as if they were, they were fields in the flight. But I can just add these on the fly and suddenly everybody has it. There's no database update required. There's no uh, new version of the app uh, uh, download required. Uh, the, the mobile apps uh, uh, can refresh and pick it up. Um, and I can add these just sort of right off uh, on the fly as it were. Um, so each property has a, a title, um, so approaches ILS, uh, a format string, which is how you display the, uh, the, the data. So in this case, you would say you'd put a zero in curly braces and say zero curly braces ILS approaches. And then that at runtime, the value gets put in where the, um, where the curly zero is. So it becomes three ILS approaches. And that's what you see when you're actually seeing your uh, the data for your flight. There's a description, which is just a text uh, description of what the property is, how it's supposed to be used, and then uh, a type. And I have, um, you know, it can be an integer or a count, you know, you, landings. You, you can do one landing or two landings. Uh, if you do one and a half landings, that's something weird. It can be um, a, a decimal value, uh, which is typically used for times. Uh, but not always. It could be used for, for monetary amounts, for example. Um, it can be a true false value. You know, I, uh, uh, this was a charity flight or this wasn't a charity flight. Uh, it can be a, uh, a, a text value. Uh, what's the name of the PIC uh, or things like that. Um, and then there are a whole bunch of flags and I'll call out a few of these here um, because, because I, th I, I think they, uh, they're interesting. So properties can be imbued with, with, with uh, different attributes. So there's actually a bunch of properties that count as a flight review. Uh, and yes, I know it's a flight review, not a BFR, sue me. Um, but like most, most check rides um, are account as a flight review. Uh, some of the check rides count as an IPC. Um, I flag the ones uh, like uh, the approaches ILS as an, as an approach so that if you, if you log three ILS approaches but your total approach count is only two, something's not right. And I actually just the other day added a new flag for landings as well. Um, there are things that should not be um, uh, summed. So uh, your total spend on a flight, yeah, you actually probably want to spend that, uh, you spend that, you probably want to total that. Um, but uh, your cost of fuel, well, that doesn't add. It, you don't add, you know, $3.70 per gallon to $6.20 per gallon. Um, there are decimals that are not time, um, and that's uh, worth, because uh, otherwise, if, if most, most decimal values are time. You know, how much solo time did you have? And if you're using um, hours and minutes format, then you... Uh, uh, then you, you, you want to uh, convert that to hours and minutes when you display it. But if it's not a time, you don't want to display it uh, uh, to hours and, and minutes. Um, no autocomplete. By default, uh, all text values will autocomplete to previously used values. So uh, name of PIC, that way you don't have to type in your name uh, all the way uh, every time. You can just start typing it and it'll, uh, it'll finish it for it. But things like first time to airport. Well, by definition, you're only ever 
doing first time to an airport once, so there's no point in auto-completing that. Or approach names, uh, that's gonna be different every time, so autocomplete isn't buying you a whole lot. And then some, some things like, uh, like first time to airport and a few others uh, are, are by uh, common convention always displaying, displayed in capital letters, and so I have a flag that will uh, convert that to caps. Um, and then there's a question on the chat. Uh, is there a plan to reorganize properties? There are a lot now. Uh, Corey, you want to unmute? And uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure what you mean by uh, reorganize them. Unmute. All right, there we go. Yeah. It just seems like there's a lot and you're, you've got a drop down there when you're scrolling, 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 not sure what to put. You know, you could probably combine some like, you have approaches and there's a lot of different types of approaches. So you can have like approaches and then uh, like a subcategory, maybe of ILS, or you could have maybe maneuvers that you performed on the flight, you know, stalls and steep turns or, you know, something where it's not quite as, you know, one level of, of um, properties, I guess. Yeah. Um, I've actually had that request um, a few times and it's, hard on a couple of levels. One is that there's no clear taxonomy. You know, sure, approaches are, are one uh, that, that do sort of group very nicely. Landings and takeoffs are two others, but there's an awful lot that are either go into multiple different categories if you were to do a taxonomy um, or that, um, that are really just sort of outliers. They, they, they don't really fit into any uh, anything. So what I mostly suggest on that is using um, uh, the type ahead. You can always search for a property to find the one you want. So if you type APPR, it's going to limit you to all the approaches. If you type LAND, it'll show you all the landings. Um, and then I also encourage people to use um, templates uh, for the set of properties that they use. Because the thing about properties is that, you're right, it, it's an overwhelming set of them. And any given pilot uses a fairly small uh, subset of those, but the subset that one pilot uses is going to be very disjoint from the subset that everyone else uses. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I, haven't found, I haven't found a good solution to, to that problem. Uh, yeah, but but I, I, I hear you. It is a, it, it, it could it could stand to be improved. Yeah, it's definitely a big problem um, to solve. Uh, you know, I, yeah, I guess another example is like uh, you know approach coupled and approach ILS. They're both they both you know they're different, but they happen on the same flight. So yeah, I, I, I get that's a big problem. Yeah, and actually, uh, approaches ILS is flagged as is in approach, but approach is coupled or is not because precisely because you can't add them. Okay, thanks. Uh, a pleasure. So some of my guidelines around um, adding properties is I try to keep them uh, general purpose where I can. Uh, so I don't have angel flight, I have charity uh, flight. And then you, know, you can use the purpose field for angel flight or something like that. Um, I, try to, if it's something that is just a note that you could put in, you know, this was a lunch flight or something like that, I generally tell people, put it in the comments. Um, the kinds of things that belong in properties are things where you want to do structured searching, um, meaning I want to find all the flights where Bob was my co-pilot, uh, or you might want to pull it into Excel and do a pivot table and filter it, or things that, that you want to uh, totals. And then the other thing that, um, that I have a, a rule about is I try to avoid things like night cross country or solo night cross country because the combinatorics explode. And it actually, um, I, this is a whole uh, digression of a rant, but uh, it's something that I can compute with higher accuracy, accuracy than you in general can log. Um, you know, if you have a flight with two hours of cross country and two hours of nighttime and it was a two hour flight, it's obviously two hours of night cross country. So if you log it, then you wasted your time. And if you log an hour and a half, then you obviously made a mistake. And if you forgot to log it, then obviously I should fill it in for you. So I compute most of these combinations automatically uh, in the 8710 form and in a few other uh, places uh, where, where it matters. Question. Quick question on properties, if I may. Sure. 
Uh, what is the difference? I notice you've got CFII instrument instruction, and then you've also got instruction instrument. What's the difference in those two properties? Uh, God, I'd have to remember. I think one is where you're actually in the role of a, a double I. Um, the other is CFIs, if I, if I remember, um, actually can provide instruction, instrument instruction. They just can't do the sign-offs. Um, there's some limit on what they can do. Uh, let me see if I can re... Oh, okay. Now, for some reason, this wasn't working for me. Because... I'm a double I, and so I usually track the time that I'm giving instruction towards an instrument rating or, or that requires a double I. But then there's a different property that also looks like it tracks instrument instruction. I just wasn't sure if there was a purpose for one vice the other. Well, I'm going to... Right now, I'm going to take a look at the, um, the descriptions. Yeah, and, so, and for, for many of these, I don't, I don't have any particular semantic, um, uh, so what was it, uh, instrument instruction, uh, that's instrument restructuring received, instructor time instrument, so time spent giving instruction. Yep, towards, that's yep. one, instruction time instrument, and then CFII, I think, instruction. Oh, like right here, CF. I think it's time in a CFII capacity was, was the difference. There was a reason that I, I had to do that. I apologize. I don't remember it off the top of my head. Okay, no worries. Yeah, look at 689 properties I'm up to right now. Yeah. Oof. Yeah, that's a lot. Uh, one thing I was wondering, kind of also to piggyback on the other guy who had asked the question okay. about organizing the, the properties, um, you know, is it possible to put all the instructor stuff, for example, you know, with instruction at the beginning or something like that. So we're not kind of searching all over the place for it. Or I, again, with, you know, 700, I guess it's difficult to manage. Yes. Um, and I do try to follow common conventions. I may not do a, uh, a perfect job of it. So here, let me, if I go over here, let me just take a quick look on that example and see how that, how I'm doing on that. So if I click here and say instruct, okay. Yeah, I guess there are a few where like instructors at the end and a few where um, I've, I'm not entirely, well, all the instructor time seems to be uh, common. This is my best answer at the moment, uh, again, because it's so hard. I haven't found a good way to do a grouping. It's just type, uh, do, the, do the type ahead uh, gotcha. and then use templates. Would it be possible to access that description? That you oh, have? yeah. Oh, in, in here. Yeah, you know something you have to add it, and then you can click. Uh, you you hover over the little question mark, and it and it gives the description. Oh, if you hover, it does that? Yeah. One one question I had right now is I'm an IFR student, and I'm trying to find um, time that I've had with an instructor. I have to show 15 hours, right? So, is there something I can do to to show that? Yep. What I would do is I would do uh, flight has the following characteristics. Uh, you would do. Uh, IMC or simulated time and dual. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of what I was doing. Oh, okay. yeah. And you would say all if you want all on that. Right. Okay. Thanks. All righty. Uh, back over to PowerPoint. All right. Endorsement templates. Here. Now that I've actually got the, the rest of my screen share working, I can actually show this one. So I've got, uh, well, I don't know how many endorsement templates I've got. I've got like 80, 85 or 86 more than more than 89 there we are okay so i've got at least 89 uh, different templates in the system so i've got a little tool here that lets me add new endorsement templates and i've got a little language here where you can just put something in uh in curly braces for a single entry that has a watermark of x uh if i do uh free form then it, it doesn't have a um a watermark uh, date for the for the prefilled date student for the uh, uh, prefilled student and things uh, separated by a slash for a drop down. And so what I, like an example on that is here's a free form uh, uh, endorsement and it, so the the body of it is simply free form. But a more common example would be down here where it says you know, I student certified that I received initial recurrent. You can see student name student. So the watermark is there and in fact student gets filled in at uh, at the time that the endorsement is issued. And then here where I said initial slash recurrent, um, it becomes initial slash recurrent and so forth. So I can add new, uh, add or edit uh, endorsement templates. 
uh, at any time. So that requires data privileges. Um, for data privileges, I can also edit the FAQ and exactly the same kind of model. Um, I give it a category and that's how they get grouped. I ask a question and then I put in an answer. It's more or less that simple. Um, I can fill in um, uh, uh, little uh, escape things for different, uh, 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 for different things that I want substituted at runtime. So one is actually my flight book uh, is brandable. So you, you can actually take the code and do a new, uh, put it up on a new server and give it a new name. Um, and this will pick up the name uh, that, that you give it. Um, I try to use the localized date and time format. So for example, in the uh, description of uh, how you import stuff, it'll say, you know, express today's date as five slash 26 slash 2020. But it'll only tell you that if you're in the US. If you're in, uh, if you're in uh, the UK, it'll say express today's date as 26 hyphen five hyphen 2020 or, or whatever format um, uh, uh, the UK uh, uses. Um, oh, uh, now I'll come, I'll come back to that. Okay. Uh, achievements. Uh, I can. Most of the achievements are baked into the code, uh, but I have a, a two pieces of admin functionality I need. One is sometimes I'll do something uh, like if I add uh, then the cache I have of everybody's achievements uh, is invalid. And so I have this button here uh, to invalidate uh, the entire cache. And so then the next time you go up to view your achievements, it'll recompute them. Um, but I also have one airport achievement in the code, but it's all based on data. And so I have several dozen achievements you can, uh, that you can earn based on the flying that you do. And so I, again, I'm always trying, I always try to be kind of coy about the achievements. You can always go and read the code, but, um, but I try to be a little bit coy about what all, all the achievements I have are. <laughs> I see B's asking. The answer is you got to read the code. Um, I, I like it to be a little bit like a, a, a video game where, you know, you, you, when, when you shoot your hundredth Nazi, you get um, some upgrade to your, to your gun uh, uh, or, and, uh, or whatever. And you didn't even know that you were going to get that, but, but hey, look at what I just earned. So uh, airport achievements. They have a title. They can be binary or, um, or have multiple levels. And so binary means you, you hit all of the airports on the list or, or you didn't. It's one or the other. Um, most, of, most of my airport achievements are not binary. So they, there's a, a bronze threshold, a silver threshold, a gold uh, 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 threshold, the platinum threshold. And the idea is, you know, if there's if there's 100 airports in the list, bronze might be 20 and silver might be 30. And that's just how many of the airports that you hit. Um, there's an overlay and that's a, uh, a graphic. So I'm showing you one of the, uh, one of the achievements. I'm actually showing two achievements and I've earned both of these. Um, it's uh, all the public use airports in Hawaii and all the public use airports in Washington. Uh, Washington actually does have the little state logo over it. Um, and I've landed at all the public airports in Hawaii, Washington, and Oregon. Um, and so I can put that little overlay so it'll show up over the badge. And then just a list of, of, the, of the codes uh, that, uh, that comprise that achievement. And so I have, a, I have a few fun ones and they're not all state-based. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure at least some of you have earned some of, the, of these, but I don't wanna, I don't wanna show them. Um, telemetry. So like what I do with the images, um, telemetry does not get saved in the database. What I do is when you upload um, telemetry uh, with or after a flight, I stick it in the database and then, um, and then I uh, uh, start a, an offline process that takes that, that data, extracts any flight path and compresses the snot out of it then replaces what was in the database with that highly compressed flight path and puts the original telemetry uh, data in a file on the disk. And so that, that buys a few things. It, 
it avoids the performance hit of having to parse and, and reparse that data every time. It reduces the size of the data in the database, and it's much, much more uh, performant because I'm not moving all that data around. And so that way, when you, when you click on a flight and I show you the map of that flight, I'm, I'm just using that compressed um, flight path, uh, not, not the, the very highly detailed raw data. When you click on flight details, which is when you click on the date of the flight on the website, then I go to the disk and I pull up the whole uh, telemetry file. And I, that way I can show you a graph and I can show you the original data and I'll show, I'll show in all of its uh, full glory. Um, but that means I have to have some tools to migrate between the database and files, and I can do that in both directions. I can find orphans if something happened um, and, and there's an orphan. I can also view all of the telemetry uh, for a given uh, uh, user. And uh, just for fun, um, I have an, uh, an Antipodes tool. Um, and uh, you can sort of see on uh, here a few years ago, I was in um, Hawaii in April, and then in August, I was in Botswana, and I realized that uh, Hawaii and Botswana are more or less on uh, opposite sides of the planet. Um, and so I have a flight track from uh, my flight home from Johannesburg, and I'm like, gee, I wonder if this year I was over the exact same spot, uh, or, two antipodes on the planet. How cool would that be? Turns out that the flight path uh, over Botswana, uh, the, the antipodes went between the island of Maui and uh, the big island. <laughs> so uh, not quite uh, antipodal, but, but, but uh, very, very close. So I, I did that tool that just lets you take your, your, uh, uh, your flight path and, and view it inverse. Uh, if anybody's interested in that, I could throw that into the, uh, the play pen as just a fun tool. Finally, I have a set of uh, miscellaneous tools. Um, and this handles, uh, here, I can show that one. Um, yeah, so if there are empty properties, um, uh, or duplicate properties, uh, it'll find those. Uh, I think I found all the bugs a few years ago that would lead to those. Um, and then I can find invalid signatures on the flight. And this is where some, uh, a, a flight is signed and it's, and it's marked as valid, but it looks like it's been changed since it was uh, signed or it's marked as invalid, but it looks like it's not changed. Uh, and it'll find all of those and, uh, and let me uh, review them. Um, and I can also uh, flush the cache on the server, which is good if I make a data change uh, on anything that is, um, uh, that is cached. Finally, I have uh, uh, two uh, reporting tools. Um, and you know, these ones I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, gray out uh, both for privacy and for, uh, uh, and, and just because it, it gets out of date really quickly. Uh, but I can see all the donations in the system. I can search for donations by user. I can add uh, transactions. So occasionally, for example, somebody will send me a paper check um, and I can put that into uh, the system here. Uh, to issue a refund, I gotta either write them a check or go uh, to PayPal. I can't do that through the system. Um, I can also reset gratuities um, to pick up, uh, you know, if, if uh, uh, somebody uh, has sent me a check, uh, a, a paper check, and now they, they've earned one of the gratuities, you know, whether it's uh, the nightly backups or something like that, uh, I, can, I can reset that. And I, see, I can see the numbers uh, broken out by year and, and month, and it's green if I'm ahead of last year uh, or the prior year, and it's red if I'm behind the prior year. Fortunately, I get enough uh, in donations to cover all of my direct costs and, uh, and let me buy some beer. Um, if uh, if I, I were paying myself, uh, I would have closed shop long ago. And then finally, um, I have stats. Uh, and this gets emailed to me every night. Um, I see how many users are on the uh, on the site. Uh, it's slow to compute, so I'm not going to show any, any real time, but it shows me, uh, it just shows me a bunch of data, you know, how, how many uh, 
flights per user, things like that. Uh, how many aircraft are on the system? How many people have uh, uh, set up email subscriptions or linked their accounts to Dropbox or things like that? Um, it, it's kind of uh, geeky stuff. And then uh, this is more information for other admins. So if somebody wants to be an admin, uh, is willing to, to dip their toe in, just call me. Uh, so this is information about, I can shunt the site. Um, so I would really only do this if I were doing a major upgrade uh, to the site, like moving from one server to another. Uh, and in which case it just puts up a, a you know, you hit the site uh, and it'll give you an error that uh, message that says that we're, you know, we're update, we're doing site maintenance and come back in an hour. Uh, and then uh, I can set up an auto reply. So next year I'm gonna go try uh, climbing Kilimanjaro. I'm gonna be out of touch for about uh, seven or eight days. And so I'm gonna have an out of office that will respond. Uh, I'll have a backup admin uh, also uh, uh, doing the, the, the most time sensitive emails. But you know, if somebody emails with a, with a feature request or something, it'll tell them, hey, I'm not ignoring you. I'm climbing a mountain. Uh, and I'll get back to you uh, in, in a few days. Uh, and then my contact information. This, this uh, uh, PowerPoint, by the way, is in the code base. It is, it, it's in GitHub, it's in the private uh, directory, uh, but, it, but it's there because, because my flightbook is open source. Uh, and so I want everyone to be able to see it. And you know, if anyone makes their own uh, instantiation of my flightbook, that way they know what the tools are. So I went a little over my one hour, but um, let me open it up to questions. That was a great presentation, thanks. thanks. Stuff most of you are probably never gonna use, but. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I think I, I, my internet went down a little bit there. Uh, it was a great presentation, thanks. Um, Back to the properties, um, one of the issues with, with selecting them, then it ad permanently adds it onto your record. Is there a way to like remove those from a record? I know you can hide them, but when you go in and you like add a property to, to hover over the question mark to see what it actually is, then it's permanently a part of your, your record. Is there a way to, to remove those? So uh, actually it's not a par permanent part of your record until you actually uh, use it in a flight. Um, so if you just add it there and don't give it a value, uh, then it won't be there next time. Uh, so two answers on that. One is um, actually, if you go over here on import and where it says description of column uh, field names for the CSV file, here are the, the main fields. But if you scroll down a little bit, here are all the properties, all ah, of them. It, it's live from the database and it has uh, the description for each one right there. So that's, that's a place where, where you can find them. Um, the other is if you go, as, as you, you, you mentioned, you, you do realize that you can drag and drop uh, to, to say, oh, I don't use this property or that property anymore. But you can also create a template. Uh, and I guess I don't, I don't show the descriptions here. You can create a template uh, uh, for, for what, what you want to show or not show uh, uh, every time. Um, the other thing, again, that I should say is for a lot of these properties, like the, the CFI instruction one, or for that matter, flight reviews. I have both a BFR and a flight review uh, uh, property. <laughs> and you use whichever one you want. Um, yeah, see, biennial flight review, there it is. And I think I have a flight review. Uh, and uh, let's see, yeah, there we are, flight review. So. You can use whichever one you want. They're both, they're, in, in this case, they're both flagged as being a flight review, so either one will work. Um, but you know, like in, in the CFI instrument time, you can use one or the other. The system doesn't care. Just make up your own, um, decide for yourself which one you want to use uh, and, and be consistent about that. You know, there are others. Uh, I have a nose number and a Buno number and a registration uh, property, and they're all slight different variations on the same thing, which is basically um, what, is the, what is the tail number on this aircraft um, that you might use, for example, um, 
uh, if you're flying an anonymous aircraft or if you're, um, you know, you're, you're recording the, the flight number or the mission number or something like that. Um, you can use whichever one of those you want. I don't, I, my flight book doesn't have any semantics around it. All right. I had a couple of questions at the beginning that I typed in that, that I guess you missed, but uh, I was just wondering how many, you know, you have other roles. How many people do you have working on this project? Is it, is it several or is it just you? Um, at the moment, it's, well, it's, it's 98% me. I have two uh, backup admins who are receiving all the, the email and stuff, but I, I'm generally the one who, who answers it. Um, but they are, uh, uh, they're, they're both pilots, they're both trained on the system, they, they, uh, and they're both software people, so they know um, uh, how, to, how to get in and, uh, and do things if necessary. Um, for the coding, it's been mostly me, but uh, I, I have had contributions. Uh, there was somebody uh, uh, a few uh, months ago who helped me migrate the code base to a different uh, uh, platform. There was uh, somebody who helped me with um, all, uh, about a year ago, I did a face, or two years ago, I did a facelift um, with a new font and new colors and stuff like that. And they, somebody else helped me with that because I don't have a design bone in my body. Um, and there's been uh, a, a few people active in GitHub uh, with, with great discussions about, hey, why aren't you doing things this way instead of that way? Um, really sort of forcing me to justify uh, the way I'm doing things. And if I can't justify it, then fix it, damn it. <laughs> so, but no, it's, it's been mostly me. Great. That's, that's awesome. And then the... I know a couple of planes I've changed, like the like I fly 172, and I've changed the the letter designator on the end. Is that something you can pull from the the FAA registry? You mean like slant alpha, slant golf? No, like um, it's a 172 golf or a 172 Lima or Romeo or the, basically the year it was manufactured. Oh. I see. Yeah, if you if you just change it from a Golf to a Lima or something, that will edit the aircraft. If right. you've actually carried the tail number forward from one aircraft to another, um, then and and it's in the same family, then give mm -hmm. me a call and I can uh, or email and I can yeah. clone it using that tool I I demonstrated. Yeah, no, I was just wondering if you could pull that information from the FAA registry so that I just type in the, 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 note, the end number and it just populates automatically. No, uh, no. The, the FAA doesn't offer that in, any, in a sufficiently structured format. And more importantly, mm -hmm. uh, most countries don't. Uh, okay. And probably half of the aircraft in the system are, are uh, FAA and the other half aren't. So, uh, ah, yeah. okay. I don't do it, but but if if you start typing November one two three and November one two three four five is in the system, it will autocomplete to that, and you can pick it. So if somebody else has already entered it, uh, then it'll it'll pick that up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But sometimes people enter it wrong, and you just have to update it and fix it. Yeah. Um, Mark asked. Oh, sorry. I was just going to answer Mark's question. Um, is there an API that would allow one to perform queries on their data from another app like Excel? And the answer is yes. Um, at two levels. The first is if you go uh, to the download page like, you know, for Excel specifically and download the Excel spreadsheet, then from within Excel, you can pull uh, the data from the website um, and then you can do pivot tables and all kinds of analysis on it uh, that you want to. The other area, and I should probably consider doing a, a webinar on this is I have a developers tab and I have some developers who are doing um, exactly this sort of thing. You can use what's called the OAuth protocol uh, to set up, uh, as I have a web service and using OAuth, you can grant per, uh, permission uh, to a, a service that you write to access your data and to upload flights and pull down your aircraft and things like that. Basically the sorts of things that the mobile apps do. Um, and this is actually exactly, OAuth is what I use to write files to your Dropbox or to push um, uh, data to Cloud Ahoy and things like that. Um, so at, at two levels, uh, you can do that. So Corey, did you say you had, had another uh, question? Yeah, I, no, I was just gonna comment on my workflow. Um, uh -huh. that, you know, one of your recent changes kind of upset. Um, oh, basically, no, no problem. 
uh, I basically I, I do my flight and I'm, when I'm on, when I'm in the airplane, you know, I'm on the iPad, I enter the flight on the iPad, I click start to start the engine and stop to stop the engine and then put in the beginning and ending Hobbs. And then I go on the website to edit that information. Well, the workflow kind of changed and now it's like more clicks to edit the flight instead. I think you just used to click on it and it brought you into the edit page. Whereas now oh, it that's brings been you a while. information. Yeah, it's been a while, but you know, it's just one of the things that, that modified my workflow. Yeah, that, that now you have to go here. To oh, I didn't know it was over there. Okay. Oh, what, what were you doing? Going to details and then? Uh, yeah, I was clicking okay. on the date because before I used to click on the date and it would take you into the edit. Uh, now I click on the details and then right. I click edit from there. Okay. Yeah. You know, you can, you can get there right, right here. I'll, okay, that's good to know. Thanks actually, a lot. Three places you can get it. You can, or you can click on the date and, uh, and, and you can get to it here. Or you can click on uh, the route, and since you own the flight, uh, you can get to it here. So click on any of them. Okay, that's, uh, that's actually a bit more robust. Well, super. Um, any topics that uh, people would like me to do for uh, a future webinar? I just wanted to say thank you very much for your time uh, and thanks for putting this together. I've been using it for, I don't know, about five years now, I guess. Uh, I've donated every year just because you put out an awesome product. Uh, you know, I've, I've asked for some help on a couple things here and there and you've been real responsive with it. So thank you very much and please keep it up. Well, thank you. I'm happy to. Uh, that makes me happy. That's, I, I do this to give back uh, to, to the pilot community. I figure um, everyone should be should have an online logbook, and it shouldn't be something that you that you have to pay for. You, we, we've got enough expenses to deal with. I started trying to code one myself. And, uh, I got I don't know, um, a basic functionality with it, and then somehow I ran across yours, and I was like, "Well, shit, his does everything that I want, and uh, and I don't have to do it." So uh, I switched over, and I've been very happy with it. So thanks. Great. Well, I'm I'm glad I'm glad it's working for you. Thank you. You, you were talking about the, the Excel. Does that actually modify the data if you modify it within Excel? No, it, no. it's pull okay. only. Because it says it says something like a refresh was went from within Excel. Does, oh, so does that just mean it constantly pulls it down? Uh, you press you press a button, but yeah, and then it, it'll okay. grab the the data from the new the data. The new yeah. data. Oh, okay, okay. You can um, use the Excel for bulk editing and then uploading. Which yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you're going to do that, I recommend starting with the CSV. You can do it starting with the with that um, Excel sheet, but you have to delete those top couple of rows for it to work, um, and and you have to remember to save it as CSV. Uh, you, you're also asking about instructors. What, yeah, what, is there a way to is there a way to give an instructor access to my flight bot without giving them my my data my password? Sorry. Correct. Yes, there are two ways you can do that. Uh, let me go back. Sorry, I got to uh, uh, share screen again. So two ways you can do that. One is you go to the instructors here and you give them access to your logbook. And, and if you want, you can also give them a, um, uh, permission to add flights to your logbook. The other way you can do it, not just to instructors, um, is you go to preferences, sharing, and then you can create a link uh, that will expose flights, totals, currencies, achievements, and or visited airports and share that link. Uh, and you can re you, uh, that can go to anybody, uh, whether they use the website or not, but, but these are only read-only views. With your instructor, uh, if you give, uh, you can give that add flights to my logbook permission and then they can, uh, they can add flights. Or, and they can, but regardless, uh, if they can view the, your logbook, they can sign flights. Great, thanks a lot. Maybe in our future future videos, um, the the flight club feature, and maybe you know some sort of social, you know, sharing with instructor, sharing with other people, that type of thing. Yeah, I'm thinking clubs might be might be a good next one to do, um, and then I think maybe a developer one could be another deep dive one, uh, talking about sort of how how you can interact with the site uh, using using an API. 
Well, super. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. It's uh, been an hour 20. Um, and uh, well, thank you everyone uh, uh, for, for joining. And uh, Mark, I realized that was a private message, but uh, contact me offline. I'm happy to point you to all the OAuth tools. Uh, so thanks everyone. Uh, I hope you had a good Memorial Day weekend and uh, I'll uh, speak to you later.